Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Thursday lunchtime lecture from us here at the Church's Conservation Trust. It's really great to be talking to everyone um, on yes, another Thursday lunchtime, but I'm aware that we get people from across the world joining us. So um, if it's not lunchtime where you are, um, especially a warm welcome to you all. But thank you for joining us. Um, as is the custom with these lectures, the first 10 minutes of this um, of this lecture and we dedicate to Church of the Week. So we will be starting the lecture shortly. But what we do in these first 10 minutes, if you join us for the first time, is that we look at one of the 356 churches which are in our care at the Church's Conservation Trust. And um, I'm really excited to be joined by my manager today. Now, Peter Ayres, um, our Chief Executive, normally does this, but he's on annual leave. So um, it falls to my manager to step in um, or step up to the plate and do Church of the Week. But we've got a really fantastic church for you all this week. So without any further delay, um, I am going to, um, oh, um, I think we've got a problem that I've just lost, um, um, Shana, so don't worry, I think I may be able to step in here, so bear with me everyone, um, while I just get a quick PowerPoint to show you all. Um, technology is great when it works, but when it doesn't, um, we have a couple of um, issues, but bear with me and I will be able to share Church of the Week with you all. Um, but again, if you're joining us for the very first time, um, a warm welcome to you all. Um, if you are um, joining us um, for the first time, do let us know where you're watching from. But also everyone who is joining us um, as a repeat viewer, do comment away and let us know where you are joining us from. I'm just quickly um, opening the PowerPoint, everyone. So we'll be able to start Church of the Week very shortly so um we'll be getting underway very shortly but apologies for this little technical issue we're having um oh oh no shana's back now um there we go so i'll pass over to shana sorry george i'm trying to keep you on your toes you see that's why i think i accidentally closed um my window when i was messing about with my notes so hello everybody i'm shana james i work with george at the church's conservation trust and today I'm going to be talking to you uh, about our Church of the Week. So first of all, I'm going to remember how to share my screen because I've been away on holiday, you see. And um, George will tell me if I'm doing it right. OK. So. First, we'd like to thank Ecclesiastical for sponsoring Church of the Week and for their continued support of our lunchtime lectures. So today's church is a treasure with a rich history and it's Langport, All Saints Langport in Somerset. In the 10th century, Langport was a fortified burr commanding an ancient crossing point on the River Parrot. The place name meaning Long Market Town suggests a settlement also extended along what is now Bow Street towards the river. Although a planned layout may have been imposed upon this part of town in the medieval period, in 1645, during the Civil War, part of the town was burned by retreating Royalist troops after the Battle of Langport, fought outside the town to the east. The church consists of a west tower, nave with aisles, south porch, north trans transept, and eastern vestry or sacristy. The building was largely reconstructed in the 15th and early 16th centuries, but is part of a 13th, parts of a 13th century window survive at the west end of the north aisle. The building is first referred to in 1202, but from at least 1381 and perhaps from its foundation, it was merely a chapelry of Hewish Episcopi, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, which is the place name. The church, or more strictly the chapel, was therefore dependent for its services upon the vicar of Hewish, who was appointed by the rector, the Archdeacon of Wells, or the chaplains or curates who served in Langport from at least the 15th century. Anti-clerical lollards also preached in the chapel, the interdict imposed as a punishment for this was lifted in 1412, but Lollardy persisted, and in 1447, the bishop complained that some of the inhabitants had prevented the curate from taking services and were burying their own dead. In 1415, the church was reconsecrated after being defiled by bloodshed. However, the church's special treasure, as you can see from, from this slide, is its east window, containing the largest collection of medieval stained glass in Somerset. The saints are shown glorious, in gloriously coloured robes with both animated and serene expressions. 
Here you can see the three saints all wearing the triple tiara of Saint Peter, showing that these saints are, saints are in fact popes. Throughout the church, you'll find portcullises, which may indicate a connection with Lady Margaret Beaufort, 1443 to 1509. She was Lady of the Manor, which the Beauforts had acquired in 1397 and used the portcullis as an emblem, as did her son and grandson. You may have heard of him, Henry VII, and then Henry VIII, um, and also the borough itself at one time. The earliest identifiable feature of the church is a late 12th century Romanesque stone carving shown here, reset over the south door. This shows the lamb bearing a cross within a circle or aureole flanked by angels and two other figures which may have come from an earlier church on this site. Its bold pinnacle west tower is covered with gargoyles like this handsome chap, also known locally as hunky punks, and it's the local landmark. And here is another of the grotesques on the tower. So that concludes Church of the Week, which this week was All Saints Langport in Somerset, and there should be a link in the chat um, to our website where you can find out more information and perhaps plan a visit. Thanks, Charlotte. Thank um, everyone, I had the privilege of being able to visit this church earlier this year. So um, some of you have known who've been following us for a while that we've benefited from Historic England and DCMS funding um, for the Here for Culture as part of the Cultural Recovery Fund. And we did some really important um, repairs at this church. Um, this church um, uses um, what's called Liarstone and we were able to do some conservation work here. Um, there'll be some films coming out very shortly where you'll be able to see some more about Langport and the work um, that has happened there and sort of some of the challenges we've faced using um, or conserving this particular material. Material. Um, but it's a fantastic church and I highly recommend you go and pay it a visit. Now if you walk down the bottom of the hill you'll see on the corner there's a fantastic little bakery and I highly recommend you go there. They make the world's biggest sausage rolls, I can tell you that. But um, we normally have a few questions um, here for our chief executive but he's not here today. So next week some of you may be aware that i mentioned last week that next week is um the second saturday um, of the month and right across england um church conservation trusts um so we're the church conservation with the national charity but it, different counties have different regional trusts and um uh, charities that help um, conserve and um, give grants to active church for worship but for the first time we're taking part in Ride and Stride um, and we're entering a team and that is a two-person team and it's myself and Shana and we're going to be cycling 39 miles around my hometown of Bury St Edmunds and we're going to be visiting 21 churches we're going to be starting at St Edmundsbury Cathedral making our way to um, right to the, um, we're going to be going north of Bury um, to a few villages along um, visiting three CCT churches so we're going to be visiting All Saints Icklingham, um, All Saints Wordwell and um, St Andrews at Sapiston. Um, but throughout the day, we'll be doing live streams, we'll be posting our progress. Um, but we'd really love it if you were able to support us. So do tweet to us, um, retweet our tweets. Um, but also, if you feel able to, um, please do consider sponsoring us. We've set up a Just Giving um, a page. Now, um, the way Just Giving works is that the proceeds of this, we're splitting 50-50 with the Suffolk Historic Churches Trust, who, as I say, they give grants um, to active parish churches. And then the remaining 50% will be going to one of the CCT churches on the route um, for conservation work and we're just um, at the moment working through our conservation plan and finalising what church that's going to be but hopefully next week I'll be able to tell you what church it's going to go to. But Shana, um, obviously I've been doing a bit of training but what are your thoughts? Are you looking forward to this um, little challenge? Um, I'm a bit out of practice actually. Um, George sort of taught me into it. Um, I have done this sort of thing before but not for a while so um, I'm sure it'll be fine. I mean stuff it's quite flat isn't it? So um, George has told me that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be okay. It's not too strenuous a route, not too many hills. So um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. So yeah, we'll be posting lots of pictures on social media. And as yeah, uh, there are a couple of hills, but um, I haven't told Shana just how big they are, but they're, they're, it, they'll be fine. We'll be fine, everyone. But um, as I said, we're going to be seeing some really cracking churches on the route. We've got round towers, we've got thatched churches, we've got um, really early medieval, so we've got Anglo-Saxon churches right up to, um, I think there is a 17th century church as well on the route. So um, do um, follow us um, 
on Facebook. You can see um, Plans of the Roots, but um, do have a look um, on our Just Giving page because we've put all the links, um, sorry, the details of the whole route on there so you can see what churches we're going to be going to. But it's going to be a notice start, but it will be a really fantastic day. Um, come rain or shine, we'll be out there cycling to those churches. Um, so do have a look at those. But everyone, welcome to um, our Thursday lunchtime lecture. We'll shortly be starting the lecture. As always, these lunchtime lectures are completely free of charge. Um, so please, if you see anybody posting links to you to watch elsewhere, please don't click them. And if they ask you for card details, please never give them over because our lectures are always 100% free of charge to watch and enjoy. You'll always also be pleased to note that we record all of these lectures. So if you miss the start of it or want to catch up on one of our previous ones, um, you can watch recordings of those. Those are also always free of charge. Um, you can watch those on our YouTube page. Um, or also on our Facebook playlist, and I'll post links to those um, in the chats, but there is also links in the video description. Now, if you're enjoying these free lectures, please do consider supporting our work. As I said, we've got 356 historic churches in our care across England, and that number is going to grow. Um, we're looking at possibly taking on two churches this year, um, and there's gonna be significant repairs needed at those. So if you feel able to, please do consider um, making a donation you can do that in a few ways you can text cct to 70331 to give us a gift of three pounds you can also donate any amount you wish securely through our website which is visitchurches.org.uk or you can do it be one of the many people who've taken us up on our special membership offer um, and become a member with us now membership starts from just three pounds fifty a month so price of cup of coffee um, and if you join us by direct debit and if you use the offer code LECTURE, and that's LECTURE in capitals, you will get a free copy of this, um, which is a fantastic book. And I know a lot of people have already received. So if you've received your copy of this, please do let know other people watching how great it is. And also let me know what your favourite chapter is, because I'm planning some in interesting content for next year. And uh, depending on what people say um, is their favourite part of the book, um, that may have a, a bearing of what piece of content we make next year. So, um, But as I said, if you join us by direct debit from £3.50 a month, you'll get a free copy of this. Also, today, um, to celebrate this lecture, we're really excited because we're selling Dr. Alex Woodcock's um, book on grotesques and gargoyles. Um, so we've sold before a few of the Shire books, um, but today we're selling Alex's one um, to do this lecture. So if you'd like to buy Alex's book, I'm afraid I haven't got it in front of me, but I know Alex is going to show it to you. Um, you'll be able to buy it from us on our website. It's just £7.99. Um, plus postage and packaging, um, but all proceeds from selling these books go towards helping us conserve historic churches across England. Now, if you have any questions for Alex at the end of his lecture, please do comment away on Facebook and we will ask Alex your questions at the end of his lecture. But well, I hope you enjoyed the lecture today. If you've got any questions, um, please comment away. Um, but everyone, welcome um, to today's lunchtime lecture. Um, Alex, over to you. Oh, um, I'll just unmute you, Alex, there. Lovely. I just share my screen. And can you see that okay? All good. Lovely. Um, well, thank you for inviting me to speak today, George and Shana and everyone at the uh, CCT. Today, uh, as you know, we're going to talk about gargoyles and grotesques. And you can see I've started titled it. Why are there monsters on medieval churches? And it's a question that people have asked for, well, the Victorians really started to ask that question, but post-medieval this um, times, this question sort of cropped up in the you know, 16th century. They were compared to hieroglyphics. And by the time we get to about the 1850s, people are generally sort of asking this question um, about what they're doing there. Cause it just didn't seem to sort of fit with uh, the Victorians certainly view of uh, churches and so forth. So hopefully towards the end of this, uh, I'll be able to sort of present you with a number of uh, options and ideas and as to why uh, they are there on churches. Right, why is my thing not working? Okie doke. Very briefly, for those of you who don't know me, um, my background as to why I'm sitting here and uh, talking to you about this subject is that I started out doing uh, archaeology, being a buildings archaeologist um, in York, worked for the National Trust for a bit, then had the option uh, of 
that you know the opportunity I should say to write a PhD which I wrote on medieval sculpture um, architectural sculpture really so the sort of thing we're going to look at today following that I um, trained as a stonemason I worked at Exeter Cathedral for a number of years um, on West Front conservation projects and various other projects at the cathedral and since then I've been um, concentrating more on writing and on teaching. Um, I currently teach on the Cathedral's Workshop Fellowship Foundation degree, which is a degree for um, cathedral craftspeople. And, and here's some of my books and some of my artwork. If you are uh, have an idle moment on the internet, do have a um, look at my website and you can have, there's a link there to my shop as well. George mentioned my book, which I've put there, but here it is as well. Uh, gargles and grotesques. I wrote this. It's ten years old, actually, today. Um, this uh, this year, not today. <laughs> um, but some of these ideas that we're going to talk about today are in that. And there's lots of pictures, crucially. So, right. So this is my plan. It's very simple, really. What are they? Where do we find them? And why are they there? I tell you those first two questions. We can kind of knock out the park in the first five minutes. The last one is the one we're going to take a dive into and really try and explore why this type of imagery is associated so strongly with uh, these carvings on churches. And we're going to explore other carvings as well briefly to sort of, you know, like roof bosses and capitals, wherever these um, grotesque imagery occurs. And then we will come back and look at these in a bit more detail to give a bit more context, really. Right, very simply, what are gargoyles and grotesques? And there is a definition, there is a distinction. A gargoyle is part of a building's drainage system. It is a water spout, effectively. Um, it gargles water away from the building um, and to you know, throw it clear of the masonry below. So it protects uh, the building. It's from the French gargoyle. Um, apologies to any French speakers out there for my uh, pronunciation, which is which means throat. A grotesque does not have this uh, water drainage function, but it is often carved in a very similar way to a gargoyle. So that's why they're often mentioned together. So a grotesque is uh, decorative. A gargoyle has a function, also uh, is you know decorative as well, also carved in a particular manner, uh, and that is gargoyles and grotesques but we usually sort of speak of them together. Where and when do we find them? Well, really, they take off in the later Gothic period from about 1300 onwards. Um, and they are, occur in the roof line positions. So as you would expect, as you would uh, expect where, the, where we need to throw water away from the building. Here's two examples, one from Somerset at Kern one from Winchelsea in East Sussex. And obviously post medieval buildings built in the Gothic style, we find gargoyles and grotesques there as well, but really they're a late medieval phenomenon. They don't spring fully formed out of the blue. There is a long, long tradition of decoration along the roof line edge. Um, if we look at Roman temples, for example, we have these pressed, these stamped clay tiles known as antifixes which often had, um, you know, sirens or other monsters, head of, head of the Gorgon, and they would be uh, arranged in this position, as you can see from that diagram. In the Romanesque period, we have corbels, carved corbels, which together form a corbel table, uh, again, in that position of uh, along the roof line there as well. And these are carved, as you can see with that picture there, at Worth and Travers in Dorset. These are carved with heads, geometric motifs, all kinds of things. Right, so now we get into the real sort of, uh, the, the, you know, the, the crux of the, of the matter here. Why are they on churches and cathedrals? Now, it's not an easy question to answer, and there are lots of possible answers and lots of competing things as well. Traditionally, there's been this perceived uh, incongruity between the form, between their image, your monsters and grotesque, and place, religious buildings. And this came out of the Victorians very um, considered idea of what churches were about. This is also, there's also been you know, uh, questions of status, 
uh, you know, considered low status, they're not monumental carving, they've been ignored, and they don't really conform to traditional um, art historical inquiry in the past. And generally they throw up more questions uh, than answers, to be honest. They, they've consistently antagonized critics, uh, one of the many reasons I like them, um, and they just generally don't fit uh, in a lot of um, traditional sort of discussions of churches. So I thought to begin, we could just start with uh, looking at what is a monster. And there's basically two types. There's ones which have names and, for, and forms that we recognize. So there's, this is a wyvern here uh, from the capital at Kilpeck, 12th century. A wyvern is a, a dragon with two legs. And then we have the ones that we struggle to name that don't have names really, such as this uh, thing at Hanwell in Oxfordshire, which has a, t uh, a leafy tail, a uh, human head, uh, a feathered wing, and the body of some kind of animal as well. We know it's a monster, we can recognize bits of it, but we don't really know what to call it. So I thought one of the best ways to start would be with two quotes over a thousand years apart, which show that actually people have often thought very similar things about uh, this kind of imagery. Now this quote is uh, from Vitruvius who wrote 10 books on architecture. Vitruvius was a first century AD uh, Roman military engineer and latterly architect. And I might have to just try and uh, squash my little uh, screen bit down to read this. Um, and this lovely quote, where he says, we now have fresco paintings of monstrosities rather than truthful representations of definite things. Yet when people see these frauds, they find no fault with them, but on the contrary are delighted and do not care whether any of them can exist or not. The fact is that pictures which are unlike reality ought not to be approved. I love that last bit. I mean, if by some chance of fate, Vitruvius was, uh, you know, through time travel, pushed into the 20th century and uh, met any of the surrealists or modernists, that would have been, uh, you know, very interesting for him, I think. I don't think he would have liked their work at all. But the key word here is delight. People are delighted by these. And he's talking about uh, wall paintings, very fashionable in the first century AD in Roman villas, and bathhouses and things like that. And we'll come back to that uh, a bit later on because it's very important in the history of the grotesque. So remember the delight. Now, 1125, Bernard of Clairvaux, head of the initially fairly austere um, Cistercian order, writes to his friend Abbot William about cloisters, uh, capital, you know, carved uh, capitals in cloisters. This is quite a famous quote, which I've butchered a bit to get it down to a small amount. And he says, what is the meaning of these ridiculous monsters of that deformed beauty, that beautiful deformity, before the very eyes of the brethren when reading. You may see there one head with many bodies or one body with numerous heads. Here is a quadruped with a serpent's tail. There is a fish with a beast's head. There a creature in front a horse, behind a goat. Another has horns at one end and a horse's tail at the other. In fact, such an endless variety of forms appear everywhere that it's more pleasant to read in the stonework than in books and to spend the day in admiring these oddities than in meditating on the law of God. So Bernard's main uh, objection to these things is that they are distracting. So, you know, we are the monks who should be reading are looking at the cloister capital carvings instead. And people have pointed out over the years that actually Bernard, as much as anyone else, was as delighted by these things, um, just in his very sort of rich uh, prose there, you know, his very uh, sharp observations of the work. So two quotes, a thousand years apart, over a thousand years apart, both saying, uh, both talking about um, one monstrous carvings, one monstrous wall paintings, that people are delighted by them, but we essentially don't like them. So from that we can take what is a monster? Well, we know it's a creature, it's a body. Its form crucially mixes up categories. And this is the, the key part here. So we often recognize it in part, but we often don't know how to name the whole thing. So for example, here we can see there's a wing uh, of, of a bird, 
uh, head of some kind of lion thing. Um, you know, there's all kinds going on. So we recognize it in part only. If we dig into what monster means, we see that it's related to two Latin words, monstrare to demonstrate and monere to warn. So monsters reveal, they are portents. And this lovely quote from the seventh century, uh, sixth and seventh century writer Isidore of Seville says, a portent does not arise contrary to nature, but contrary to what nature is understood to be, by which he meant that monsters police our boundaries of understanding. We can't get, get rid of them because whenever they occur at the edges, that's why we can recognize them in part, but not in whole. So it's how we have um, set out our understanding, our categories of meaning, they mix those all up. Now, just to sort of uh, look at some, uh, a few named uh, examples, things that we, we have names for, monsters that are, um, you know, we can recognize. This is a, an amphisbena, and this uh, is a dragon which has a second head at the end of its tail. And it occurs in forms which are quite un-dragon-like in places, such as on this font at Luppet in Devon, uh, with this wonderful grin matched by the, the head at the other end. And there's uh, a dragon form here as well on a capital. Perhaps better known, we have classical monsters that filter into this world, like the harpy. Uh, these are from Exeter Cathedral uh, in the Misericords, which were quite retro when they were carved. They seem to have a lot of Romanesque motifs in them, even in the mid 15th, mid 13th century. Uh, but I particularly like this uh, double-bodied harpy, which has a foliate tail and human hands for feet as well, which is clapping. It's a quite unusual image there. And of course, mermaids, uh, we all recognize mermaids, but they didn't uh, acquire their fish tails for about seventh, eighth centuries. Um, they started out with wings as well. And in some places we find the winged and tailed uh, mermaid or siren, such as at Queen Camel. Uh, in Somerset, uh, in that little drawing there. So these are the kinds of things that the named monsters that we find uh, in this kind of area. So how have we understood these creatures? And we sort of need to dig into this a bit to understand the story of how we have received them and how we look at them today. Now, I started out by saying um, Victorians were asking questions of gargoyles and grotesques and what they were doing there. And in the mid 19th century, this idea that all um, medieval art had meaning and was there to um, transmit very, very specific ideas to people uh, was really condensed and, uh, and put into the literature by Victor Hugo in his novel, Notre Dame de Paris. And the quote, that he started that with is, in the Middle Ages, men had no great thought that he did not write down in stone. Now this became very influential. He was connected to a lot of art historians as well. And of course, it makes perfect sense when we look at things like this, you know, great portals, timpana, major works. The art historian Emile Marl, writing here in religious art in France of the 13th century, uh, you know, basically elaborates on this and says, to the Middle Ages, art was didactic. All it was necessary that men should know the history of the world from the creation, dogmas of religion, the examples of the saints, the hierarchy of the virtues, the range of the sciences, arts and crafts. All these were taught them by the windows of the church or by the statues in the porch. Now, if we put aside for a moment all kinds of uh, troublesome questions about authorial intent or the status of uh, words and images and their interaction and things like that. This certainly does make sense. And one text in particular seems to provide the answer for the kind of things we're looking at, you know, the animals and the beasts and the monsters in, um, that we find on the roof lines as gargoyles. And that is uh, a text known as the Bestry. Now, these were a class of manuscripts which collected together um, sort of scientific uh, information, natural, ob natural observations, all wrapped up in a kind of a, a moralizing Christian context. Um, one doorway in particular became uh, a 
prime example of how we could understand this imagery, and that's the doorway at Alne in Yorkshire, um, because that had a text identifying the beasts and the monsters around it. It's a Romanesque doorway. And from this, uh, writers extrapolated outward saying, well, look, we can identify these creatures, so that, that must apply to all the other churches. And so this great quest to try and find answers in vestries to um, animals and, and monsters carved on churches started here. Particularly John Romilly Allen really went to town on this, and his writing was very influential. Um, I've just, for no other reason than we're talking about bestries here, thrown in my favourite bestiary creature, which is the, the Bonacon, um, which is kind of like a stag, I suppose, but with curvy horns. But its key attribute is that when startled, it emits a fiery dung. And as we can see in this uh, manuscript illustration, this particular gentleman has come equipped for this with a shield, which is very fortunate for, for him. Now, the problem is, as researchers took this idea, went out and thought, great, we, we can find texts for this and we can explain all of these images on churches from grotesques down to capitals, whatever. They couldn't, they couldn't find the texts. They couldn't find a textual sort of uh, meaning for a lot of them. And then arose the idea, well, we can't really see them that clearly. Some of them are very high up, it's probably meaningless. One book that contributed to this in a fairly negative way, because it was such an influential book, is this one, Medieval Figure Sculpture in England, um, published in 1912. And uh, the authors, Edward Pryor and Arthur Gardner, wrote, um, the function of these lesser architectural carvings was to be slight and summary, and like their subjects, their style should not be taken too seriously. So they kind of dismissed them all in, one, in a stroke over about three pages, and that was that. As the sort of 20th century wore on, as we got to the sort of uh, 30s, 40s, 50s, this I these ideas kind of gathered ground. Um, and while uh, Mary Anderson writing here in her book on Misericords, she wrote a number of books, Misericords, drama in English churches, animals in English churches. Um, while she wasn't uncritical of this idea, she kind of started to, um, simply because people were caught between everything has meaning and except these ones have any meaning, was trying to sort of find a way through. This brought up this sort of idea that somehow the sculptors were childish, didn't really know what they were doing, uh, and they were sort of making things up as they went along. And so it's from the middle years of the 20th century that this idea of masons somehow getting away with uh, carving gargoyles, monsters and so forth comes. Right. Just to sum up what we've gone through very briefly, we've sort of swung from one idea to, to the other. All art can be explained. This includes gargles and grotesques that came out of the 19th century age of faith. Texts will provide the answers. People went out, had a look at gargles and grotesques, couldn't find texts, therefore probably meaningless and their creators childish or somehow got away with it. Let's take a breather and back like playing pig for a moment, just to sort of gather ourselves. Of course, um, animals doing human uh, things like playing musical instruments or preaching, as, you know, as, we see that, um, as we see in some cases, is entirely appropriate to this world of uh, gargoyles, grotesques, the roof line imagery, because it's an inversion. It fits this thing of things not being quite what they are. As we move further into 70s, 80s, this idea of context became much more crucial. And as ideas, um, circulated into the humanities from philosophy and social sciences and so forth, churches started to become understood in a slightly more expansive, different way. And that they occupied zones that, occup that drew in all aspects of medieval community life. Um, also, people started to realise what Bernard of Clairvaux had been saying in the, the 1120s, that carving is costly. So in cost suggests it has a status. These things were meant to be there. And that churches occupied this world, which is both sacred and profane, and multiple things were going on. As you can see, if you've read this quote, a lovely quote, Thomas of Jobham, uh, subdeacon of Salisbury Cathedral, um, saying, it is well known that until now, there's been the perverse custom in many places, where on any holy feast day, wanton women and youthful fools gather together 
and sing wanton and diabolical songs the whole night through in the churchyards and in the church to which they lead their ring dances and practice many other shameful games. So churches weren't these pure um, places that Victorians often had assumed they were. And so this idea that the grotesque kind of fits this was starting to sort of filter, filter in. And yes, the church is a place of overlap between human and divine uh, as well, attached to all of that. And if we sort of go back to this idea of um, carving being costly and having a status and start to really interrogate bits of churches that we know were paid for by definite named patrons. We can see um, that monsters appear with angels and all kinds of other figures. This is um, North Nave Arcade at uh, Horwood in North Devon, um, an aisle paid for by the Pollard family, principally to house a tomb to Emma or Alice Pollard. Um, but crucially, the capital uh, of the column nearest to the tomb is carved with angels, but there is also a mermaid in there holding a shield too. And we can't imagine for a moment that this was somehow made up or, or snuck in. This is definite imagery. I wonder if here the mermaid isn't occupying uh, an ancient role that is somehow filtered in of being um, a soul carrier you know, from death to new life as she was in uh, centuries before. It's an interesting one to go and have a look at and a, and a ponder over. And we look at churches like this by Freston and Kent, the Kilpack of the South, covered in uh, monstrous carvings, very French in its style. Um, we look at the tympanum, which people would have been walking into the church underneath. We see Christ within the, uh, the Vis Copesis, uh, surrounded by angels, but at the lowermost, the bottom level there, I don't know if my little pointer will work, We've got a, a sphinx, a mermaid, another mermaid waving a fish uh, and a sort of a griffin. So at the lowest level, at the, the, the point between, um, you know, the heavenly sort of orders and, and, and us humans, we have monsters as a mediator between the two, which I think is interesting. Now, in the early 90s, this book was published, Image on the Edge, and it introduced this idea or, or gathered together this idea that had been scholars have been talking about writing about since about the late 60s of, mar of this marginal imagery, marginal sculpture. Really good book, do recommend it. It's been reprinted um, or lately, I think a couple of years ago, Reaction Books, so it is available still. Michael Camille was very keen to explore the playful aspect of these and yet somehow show that this was connected to uh, a very serious part of uh, medieval art. This wasn't something that Pryor and Gardner, uh, as they said in 1912, could be dismissed, that they were lesser. These were things that were as important as any other um, carving in cathedrals and churches. Really good read, very accessible read, and a good starting point really for um, getting into some of this work. It doesn't just talk about sculpture, it talks about texts, um, manuscripts, all kinds of things and a key influence on a lot of people's work, mine included. So a quick gallop to show uh, through all of this, to show that architectural sculpture went through about 100, 150 years of this, you know, stuff is very meaningful, it's meaningless, and yet it's carved on key parts of buildings. It is the architecture. It's not a thing you could do without, you know, it holds these buildings up in a lot of places, roof bosses, for example. It is connected to its social religious context and there is little separation between the sacred and the profane in its imagery. This particular carving is one of those rare ones which I think can be associated with the carver William of Montacute who worked at Exeter in uh, the 14th century. We're gonna look at another one of his uh, later on. And it shows the trickster Markolf. Now Markolf and Solomon uh, was a, a big uh, medieval legend. It's this, this continual um, battle, battle that's sort of to and fro between the king, Solomon, and the trickster Markolf, who would undermine uh, or, 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 or sort of answer his riddles. And this is one of appearing before the king, you know, neither clothed nor naked, neither riding nor walking, 
neither moving forward nor backward that all of that kind of thing so he's wearing a net and he's sort of riding a goat looking the other way i think william of montague had probably quite a satirical mind and uh, we'll we'll see that in a moment as well now at this point i should tell you really about the origin of the grotesque because this is the kind of thing that vitruvius uh, was writing about in that quote we started with you know that people were delighted by the grotesque really well it was discovered it's an archaeological discovery in the 15th century what happened was these roman villas and bathhouses that he was railing against with all this imagery and got rediscovered and they got rediscovered uh, at this point as cities grew up and over them and around them they had become caves so as people found these cavernous places with all these wall paintings in them they became known as uh, grotto-esque they were the, the paintings in the grottos and so it's a 15th century word and um, there was a huge revival in the renaissance as this was discovered uh, and these fantastic photos here from siena cathedral um, that um, Eleni Avram sent to me, thank you very much. They are fantastic. They just show what the kind of things that Vitruvius in the first century was railing against and um, really took off in the 15th and 16th. You can see it's this mixture of vegetable, animal, um, you know, recognizable things, classical monsters, all kinds of things like that. And here's another one. And they often appear as frames surrounding more traditional scenes too, such as uh, in this photograph here. Wonderful little sort of strange leafy winged uh, seal-like things in some of them. And the words got associated with medieval carvings uh, in the sort of 19th century. Now what is the grotesque then? Well, we know what it is in terms of you know, visually, but what actually is it? In 1994, a brilliant PhD it was written at the University of Tel Aviv uh, by Madeleine Sector, and it was called Defining the Grotesque and Aesthetic of Liminality. And she argued that basically it's a visualization of the boundary. It is, um, it comes, you know, it's, a, it's the visual aspect of the liminal. So the liminal is uh, the threshold between one thing and another. And the grotesque is the, the visual aspect of that. And so it's an attempt to sort of illustrate or visualize what is outside our meaningful categories. So we've seen, you know, this is what monsters do. They combine all these different things and they make something which we've never seen before. We don't know what it is. And it's something we don't know about. So monsters do tend to cluster in those places where our knowledge runs thin. Um, we don't know what we we're looking at it polices the very edge of what is known. Techniques of the grotesque then, well they include a number of things and sorry I didn't give you any warning about this slide whatsoever but I'm sure as you've turned up to a, a talk about gargoyles and grotesques you're probably completely unshockable. Um, a book written uh, by Eva Kuriluk, uh, essentially about 19th century art, um, called Salome and Judas in the Cave of Sex, she discusses a number of techniques of the grotesque and these include distortion, exaggeration, hybridity, which we've seen with monsters, repetition, excess, so a focus on energy, violence, uh, some in some cases and force, and particularly relevant to these three illustrations here, uh, a focus on the edges of the body in between inside and outside, because it's, it's a boundary, it's a liminal uh, place. And of course, this is something we find in medieval art. So all these carvings here, uh, gargoyles, corbels, um, are displaying techniques or could be said to be displaying these techniques of the grotesque by uh, this focus on the edges of the body. I mentioned, you know, violence as an aspect of one of these techniques of the grotesque. And it's funny when you walk around and look at some of these uh, carvings, some of these, you know, where monsters occur, you know, I've often wondered about where you get people fighting each other as we have one. This is another side of that font at uh, Luckett. 
this like you know people fighting next to uh, bishops strange monsters heads whatever as we have here so we've got two people fighting with axes and shields we've got a, a head beneath them we've got another head with a beast uh, either a beast head eating it or uh, a beast head being worn uh, on the right hand side that's the the back end of a centaur i mean it's all it all creates a very strange atmosphere these are odd odd places that is these is imagery conjures but it's entirely in keeping with how the grotesque works now you're probably sitting there and quite rightly too saying well hang on you've just told us that the grotesque is a 15th uh, it was made up in the 15th century it's a renaissance word essentially um which it was it's discovered through rediscovering first century ad um wall paintings what did medieval people know these things as well there is a word um, which so far I've only been able to trace from the early 14th century and that's Babwin or Babwin. Um, I'm not fully sure how to pronounce it. I'm sure somebody can tell me. This is related to uh, the word baboon and uh, Michael Camille uh, in his book Image on the Edge says it generally was likely to have mean, meant monkeying around, sort of playing around that kind of thing. Chaucer uses it in the House of Fame mentions pinnacles and babe winds so it's a very architectural context which is entirely in keeping with where we're finding these things um and in the extra cathedral fabric accounts there is this uh, contraction of it to bab carved by william of montague in 1312. i think these are those two bab if we can um if you recall that pic that's carving of uh, markov on his goat um, this is the only uh, monkey in hundreds and hundreds of carvings uh, in Exeter Cathedral, and he's in a very similar position to uh, Markov on his goat. We know uh, where this particular, these two capitals occur, that uh, it was a time and a place where William of Montague was working. So I think there's a, a, a link by the same carver there. And as I said earlier, I think he had probably quite a satirical mind. Um, for for this work another aspect we need to um, think about actually is connected to all of this as well uh, is the idea of apotropaea now the rise of um and the popularity of a lot of medieval graffiti uh surveys and community archaeology projects has brought this word into a, a wider circulation than it used to have and what it means is to turn away so it's images that have this power somehow to repel. This raises all kinds of interesting questions, I think, and I think it's a really interesting one to think about in terms of gargoyles and grotesques, because what it means is images aren't necessarily meant for a human audience. Now, this is something that might sound strange to us, but wasn't particularly unusual to people in the Middle Ages who did interpret natural phenomena as you know, the work of demons or certainly malevolent spirits sometimes. If you read Chronicle of John Stone, written by a monk at Canterbury in the 15th century, there's one passage where he talks about a storm that damaged one of the towers uh, at the cathedral, and he writes about it as, a, as the work of a, of a demon attacking the building. How, how do we protect our buildings in the Middle Ages? How do we stop this uh, influence? We use images. Um, Alfred Gell, the anthropologist, wrote that there are really two ways that apotropaic images work. There are, uh, you can either entrap uh, your uh, malevolent spirits by repeating patterns, or you can repel them via shock or fright. So images that are shocking completely over the top. Obviously, what we're talking about today is perfect for that. So gargoyles and grotesques may have had uh, an apotropaic role, a traditional role in protecting objects of high status, fonts, buildings. And also the people using those buildings and those spaces too. Just to really sort of throw in, uh, throw the cat among the pigeons, I want to introduce you, if you don't already know, of the work of uh, Pseudo Dionysius. Now, you don't start out calling yourself pseudo something. Um, he was understood to be uh, a disciple of St. Paul, 
Dionysius uh, throughout the, most of the Middle Ages. It was only disproved from uh, the 15th century when the pseudo was attached to his name. But throughout the Middle Ages, his work uh, on mystical theology was very important and it sort of filtered through into a lot of medieval thought. His idea of uh, negative theology was that um, you know, the divine can be known through what it isn't. And he writes about strategies of disarrangement and particularly this idea that manifestation through dissimilar shapes is more correctly to be applied to the invisible. Now this places the monster in a really interesting place um, as the closest possible form uh, to visualizing the sacred that we can get to. And if you think we can only partially recognize monsters, they stand at the very edges of our understanding because that's exactly what they are. They throw up all these things that we don't know, mix it all together, mix all the categories of meaning and present us with an image. Um, then we see that perhaps we should consider the monster much like that tympanum at um, Barfreston as a bridge somehow between the material and the spiritual worlds and participating in both. So there's a lot going on potentially with uh, monstrous imagery, gargoyles and grotesques in medieval churches. Just as a breather, I hope I haven't gone on too long. Nope, not too bad. Um, have a breather for a moment and look at a spiky uh, weathered winged thing. I do like this particular uh, image here because it's uh, a strangely um, appropriate sort of meeting of pigeon deterrent and, you know, medieval sculpture. I think the sort of the two work together quite well. The pigeon deterrents, are those spikes that have been put along the, the edge there to stop pigeons landing. But um, they've been extended out over onto the grotesque as well, making it even more spiky and fearsome, I think, uh, which is great. Um, now, I've said I don't really like to throw too much text at you, um, but I realise I have throughout all of this, and I'm going to do it again in a moment by saying, I started out by saying, well, perhaps I can answer this question of um, what they're doing there, why these things are there. And I think we've looked at a number, a number of possibilities. So and perhaps the broadest answer, the biggest, loosest catch-all answer as to why we have gargoyles and grotesques on churches beyond the practical function for gargoyles is that they help to identify churches as extra ordinary spaces. And I, that hyphen is there deliberately. These are spaces that are extra ordinary. They're ordinary as well in terms of you know, meeting places in the center of community life, but they have something else going on. How do they do this? Well, we've seen uh, the aesthetic, you know, the grotesque, it mixes up and undermines our meaningful categories. So it makes images very hard to define. And again, this introduces a, an unfamiliar element. The fact that these are so closely embedded in architecture, does that help to identify the architecture itself as a similarly indefinable place? It might do, you know, in between human and divine worlds. As we've just seen through uh, that brief uh, introduction of pseudo Dionysius, the grotesque visualization of the unknown, you know, we need to flip the whole thing around. It's possibly the most appropriate imagery for churches, perhaps the closest it is possible to get to representing the sacred. Um, of course, churches being, you know, uh, places where uh, rituals, religious behavior, you know, the sacred is encouraged to sort of manifest. It means that they're dangerous places. And so the grotesque fulfills well, roles warning people of this as portents and protecting people from this as apotropaia. And the broadest context, churches use the odds as a modern view of them, or rather perhaps a, a late Victorian view of them. And their imagery reflects this. You know, we have to look at these places as, um, you know, these carvings rather as high status. You know, it takes time to carve these things takes time, takes ex it's expensive. Patrons, whether individual or communities, want them on their buildings. Now, I mentioned a few books uh, in the course of, uh, of my talk. I wouldn't normally sort of throw in a little bibliography, but I have, just in case you wanted to dive in further, Michael Camille, Image on the Edge. It's a great starting place for this. If you really want to take a deep dive uh, into the 
ideas of the grotesque. Um, Gigi Harpham's on the grotesque. Again, that's been reprinted uh, in the last couple of years. That's a good one uh, about art and literature. It looks at how it works. Uh, I mentioned Eva Kurluk. Um, essentially, her book is about Aubrey Beardsley and 19th century art, but fantastic uh, few pages at the back um, about how the techniques of the grotesque. Uh, and there's that PhD, which has yet to be published, Madeline Sector's Defining the Grotesque. I don't know, you may be able to get it uh, and read it online. Uh, but it, again, that is a fantastic um, background to all of this. Oh, so there we are. And there's my book. Uh, if you fail, uh, you know, if you just want to look at some nice pictures and, and don't want to dive into all of this, that, all of that, uh, there's always this. Um, and many of these ideas that we've uh, looked at today are explored in this in under 10,000 words <laughs> and some drawings too. So there we are. I hope I've, um, you know, made it, introduced a few nuances, made the whole thing seem far more complex than perhaps uh, the, you might have thought. I know these images are often very immediate, very appealing, and we get drawn into looking at them. And for, for a lot of us, it's how we can start to engage with historic buildings. So they're really important. Um, and yes, there's a lot going on, and much more than I think uh, we've traditionally given credit to. So I hope that's uh, brought some different levels of uh, thought and ideas to you about medieval uh, roofline carvings, gargoyles and grotesques and their imagery. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alex. That was a fantastic lecture and you've certainly given people a lot to think about and the comments are really, um, really fantastic. So thank you so much um, for your lecture there. Um, everyone, we're shortly going to be going on to question time. Um, we're, so now is your chance to ask Alex um, any questions you have. Now, if you'd like to buy Alex's book that he's got on show there, you can buy that from us at the Trust. Um, it's seven pounds ninety nine pence. Um, if you buy that from us today, um, so um, and it's plus post and packaging on top of that. But we will ship internationally, and um, we're we're ready to um, start doing orders, um, shipping those out. Hopefully on Monday they'll be shipped out. We're just waiting for the delivery from publishers. Um, but if you've got any questions about orders or the books, um, do let us know. Um, but we're going to go into question time now, everyone. So, Alex, there's been some really interesting questions coming in. So I'm going to dive oh. straight in. Um, oh, someone's quickly asked about the Shah book. Are any, does your Shah book have references in the bibliography? It has, as is um, a case with Shire, a page of further reading. Um, and yes, so it's, it's not an academic book, but there is a page of further reading, which is you know, fairly in depth. So yes, to a degree. It's it's not, when you say references, I think of footnotes, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. It's not that. It's a, it's like a, a select bibliography. Thanks, Alex. Um, so the first question that I'm going to dive straight into, um, particularly your talk, was that, did the stonemasons have a repertoire of carving gargles and grotesques, or did someone paying for a carving request a head of a specific animal or a body of that or a human feet, for example? Well, thank you. I mean, this is this is still the question. There's still so much unknown. Um, I imagine from, you know, having looked around at a lot of these carvings that there are certain styles that take off in particular regions. So for example, um, and I think Shana mentioned at the very start of this about hunky punks, and that is a particular style of Somerset carved uh, monsters in a particular crouching position and so that's a very regional thing how whether people turned up and said actually can you incorporate you know a leg of a bat uh, and a wing of a a hen and uh, you know and a beak or something we, that we just we simply don't know but i think regional styles certainly took off and um like you say a repertoire of carvings in particularly in certain areas would have been established yeah for sure it's really interesting. And for those of you who follow us on Twitter and that we're the, at the CCT, you've seen I've been doing some filming this week um, in East Anglia in Cambridgeshire and Suffolk. Um, yesterday, I was at the Church of St. Nicholas Denston, um, which is a really fantastic church in the middle of nowhere. Um, 
but it's huge and you go inside and they've got these elaborately carved ends and it was interesting the church woman came and um, gave me a little tour around and she was really proud of these bench ends and it was really interesting she was saying that the people who carved them um so there were elephants there were lions they'd clearly never seen um any of these animals in the flesh before because the um certainly the elephant it had a duck's beak um it had these ears which are almost like dog ears and then it had um, a really strange um tongue come out of its beak so this it's really interesting to see how wood carvers never seen it i take it that would apply also to stonemasons they probably never saw a lot of the beasts so it's kind of just up to pure fantasy and their imagination to a certain degree yes i mean the, there's that famous example of the like you're mentioning an elephant there's an elephant on a misericord in uh, exeter cathedral as well which has you know very strange kind of hooves going on um, and so it's a mixture of things being seen, uh, you know, and drawn in manuscripts and things made up and from what people have heard, uh, spoken about, perhaps, you know, via drama, mystery plays, sermons, all kinds of popular sort of legends and folk tales, a mixture of things coming together, I think, you know, visual, heard, um, and yeah, legends, stories, all kinds of things. And uh, someone's asked this question, and um, could I ask Alex for his thoughts on a very rudimentary centaur with giraffe horns that is carved prominently, central on the left-hand side of the archway between the nave and chancel in their parish church? Um, if you could let us know what parish church it is, and if you po post um, an image or you can Facebook message us with an image, I'll, I can email that over to Alex and we'll try and get you an answer, um, and we'll try and get some thoughts. That, unless you, do you know which one they might be talking about, Alex? Uh, I don't, off the top of my head, but I can tell you that centaurs um you know there's this great sort of how how we get them how we end up with mermaids sirens centaurs all these kind of classical monsters they all get filtered in um into romanesque sculpture and then they they sort of get filtered through that into uh, gothic sculpture as well so the, by the time we have them being carved in the 1300s 1400s they've lost any kind of you know pagan meaning and they've been brought into a very Christian world that said it's a very different Christian world where all these things are you know part and parcel of it but centaurs and sirens often appear together there's a partnership and that's established long back in Romanesque art as well and there's all kinds of meanings associated with centaurs as well um, which I won't go into here because it's very hard to sort of pin them down to particular carvings but essentially they're fulfilling that role of a you know a you know a monster in, in a church or on a church as you know perhaps suggesting this is a place where much more goes on than meets the eye and i think uh, an interesting question that's come in alex is that um someone's asked um what about when um grotesques and gargles occur on private houses is this um rare or have we do we actually see it quite quite commonly no, it's, um, thank you. Um, it's something I left out of this talk for, for reasons of brevity is that, you know, these things do occur on secular buildings, castles, uh, you know, fairly extravagant houses and so forth. And I think um, it's, it's related to status that we were talking about. You know, these are associated with churches. They're very desirable things to have. It may be connected to ideas that they have a protective power as well. Um, and that's, I think, how they would sort of, how secular patrons would, would have viewed them and said, well, look, if you've got five of them on the church, can I have some as well? Because, you know, I want my house to be as sort of grand and as uh, displaying that I can pay carvers and that it's also somehow a little bit protected from stuff too. So I think it translates that way, you know, that it's, they concentrate on churches and religious buildings and then the status perhaps is, uh, connected to secular buildings too. And you mentioned that you used to work at Exeter Cathedral and uh, you've obviously trained as a stonemason. And yeah. what's the difference between when, um, are, and uh, indeed are gargoyles and grotesques still made for modern churches and mm. cathedrals? And what's the thought process that goes into them? Is it very different, do you think, um, to the medieval processes? Well, I mean, uh, yes. I mean, they are still made uh, and I have seen um, many, many fantastic new ones. And what is great um, about, I mean, I've carved one myself. What is great about them and generally how churches and cathedrals go about it now is that they are quite contemporary. So 
in some places, uh, the cathedral architect will want something that fits that particular area. So I've carved one which is in a 14th century style. It's very sort of straightforward. It fits uh, with the run of other 14th century heads. Uh, colleagues of mine uh, have carved things, of, you know, things from horror films, uh, things made up from contemporary, you know, um, if the fabric committee say yes, then it's a go. And there are wonderful, there's quite a famous one of the creature from Alien, I uh, forget which cathedral it's on, but it keeps that tradition alive of contemporary horror, basically. I, I want to say York Minster because I think there's also a uh, it's Ivy York Minster Canterbury because there's also a really famous one, isn't it, of a plague doctor um, with the, the mask on and the glasses, yeah, yeah, and it yeah. just goes to show, doesn't it, that um, whole kind of idea of fantasy and ingenuity that go, went onto it. Linked into that kind of idea about sort of playfulness, I suppose, Alex. One question that's come in is that what do you think is there a difference? Do you think between why the gargoyles and grotesques are created? versus things um, almost pagan like Green Men and Sheila and the Gigs? It's all part of the same world, the same sort of, you know, repertoire, really. Um, Sheila and the Gigs and Green Men aren't pagan. I hate to sort of break this, but they are a Christian thing. Um, Green Men has a very distinct narrative that started, you know, it was invented in 1939 by Julia Somerset, the term Green Man and applied to this. And that kind of separated them out into a folklore context in terms of how we've understood them. And uh, recent work, uh, particularly by Cassandra Harrington, um, is sort of beginning to reintroduce them it back into their medieval context as foliate heads. So the whole green man narrative has brought in, that, that sort of, to me, sits separately from the, the things themselves. Now, the idea of pagan imagery in in medieval churches has generated a lot of writing and a lot of thought, but actually some of it is, is helpful, some of it isn't. Ultimately, we need to see medieval churches, medieval Christianity has been very different from what we understand it to be. Churches being used in very different ways. This is imagery which is not considered pagan. It's not carved in a pagan context, you know. So, but it sits within a medieval Christian world. Um, so there's a lot going on and to, you know, we now have to, um, this, the, the whole pagan narrative is great. It adds, it adds something, but I think it's a separate thing from the images themselves. If you see what I mean, I mean, this is a whole other talk, to be honest, the, the pagan imagery in medieval churches. So I can't. I know, uh, the, really there's a to, question um, that sort of is linked to the whole idea about she and it might be again separate, but, uh, that some said um, you don't seem to consider that Romanesque corbels are eligible as grotesques. Is this the case? And if so, why not? They use, um, well, we, for a start, we don't call them grotesques. We call them corbels. They certainly use techniques of the grotesque. They have monsters and things on them. It's just that, okay, it's, I suppose it's how I, I call them. You know, um, we, we tend to call them corbels. They're Romanesque corbels, but we know they've got monsters on them. So yeah, they certainly have grotesque imagery there. Um, I was trying to keep the distinction of talking about gargles and grotesques because that's what they're known as uh, architecturally. Um, and trying to avoid getting too complicated because there is the grotesque as an idea uh, uh, and grotesques as a, as a distinct architectural feature. But of course, yeah, Romanesque corbels use grotesque techniques. Medieval bench ends use grotesque techniques. You know, wherever we find these things, that it's it, that is the grotesque. But yeah, it, there's, there's a distinction in terms of architectural names as to what we call things. That's all. And it's, it's a question I nearly ask every week um, when we're looking at something like this. But someone has beaten me to it, and they've asked, um, "Do you have a favourite gargoyle or grotesque?" Wow. Um, gosh, that's really well. Um, yeah, I suppose, yeah, there's a few, there's a few. There's, uh, I really like the one that's on the cover of my, of my book, funnily enough, at Adderbury in uh, North Oxfordshire. There's a group of churches that if you're in the area are an absolute gargoyle, grotesque spotter's paradise. And that's Adderbury, uh, Hanwell and Bloxham. And they're really worth, if you have a day, 
to go around and take photos because they are teeming with these things and likely to be carved by a similar set of masons in 14th, 15th centuries. So there's that one. I really like him. I've done a I've done a lino cut print of him lately, which has sort of really brought out some of these mad aspects. Um, I, oh, I don't know really. That's really hard to answer. I'm gonna have to think about. I'll be thinking about that now for weeks. <laughs> well, it, thank it, you. It's a hard question, I know, but um, yeah, thank you for those points there. And I think that kind of brings question time to an end, everyone. But thank you so much for your questions, everyone. Again, thank you to Alex for the time I'm um, given today for doing the lecture. Um, as we said, um, you can buy Alex's book from us today for just £7.99 plus post packaging. Um, if you've enjoyed this lecture, please do consider um, making a donation to help us caring in caring for our, our collection of 356 historic churches. But also do consider becoming a member. And as I said at the start um, of the lecture, if you become a member by direct debit from just £3.50 per month, and if you use the off-code lecture, you will get a free copy of this book. Um, and this is The Secret Language of Churches and Cathedrals Decoding the sacred symbolism of Christianity's holy um, buildings. And that was written, this was written by a um, previous lunchtime lecturer of us, um, of ours, Dr. Richard Stepp, and he's coming back um, in a month or so to do a follow-up lecture. Um, you can also, if you've or, already were a member or would just like to buy the book, you can do that. Um, we're selling that for £16 plus potion packaging through our website. Also, um, I think that brings um, today's um, session to an end. But so next week we are going to be joined by, um, oh, let me get the proper, proper the talk there. Um, so we're going to be joined by um, Sean, who is the CEO of Fulham Palace. And um, uh, also with um, Alex Hassan, who's community ar archaeologist, and Sean Harrington, I'm sorry, um, who's the CEO. And we're looking at restoring Fulham Palace, Bricks, Botany and Bishops. Now, for those of you who are aware, Fulham Palace um, was, up until um, the 60s, I believe, the residence for the Bishops of London and has a fascinating history. And um, so we're going to be looking at um, one of England's most important Bishops' palaces next week. Um, so do join us at the same time for that lunchtime lecture. Now, do keep watching these lectures, do keep sharing them. Um, we'll be making an announcement, um, hopefully in a couple of weeks, about a new member benefit um, that's going to be launching. Um, so um, you'll see teasers coming out on our social media over the coming weeks. Um, but I look forward to letting you all know um, about this new exciting development. But I think a lot of you are going to be really um, excited and can't wait to um, access um, these new um, resources that we're going to be producing um, for members. So do keep a lookout. But as always, if you've got ideas for lectures, that you'd like to like would like us to consider putting on please do comment away but you can also email me and you can email me at digital at the cct.org.uk um, I'm now planning lectures for next year so um, if you've got any ideas please do um, let me know because I would love to hear your suggestions but thank you ever so much everyone and thank you Alex um, for giving us time um, freely to do today's thank lecture um, take care everyone and have a great week